Good morning. Thank you, Grace. Just going to wait till the other PowerPoint is loaded up. Um, although this message is focused for mothers, I just want to preface what I'm going to say that it is also applicable to mothers in the making and to mothers in Israel. It applies to every female, really. Now, some of you may be wondering why in the world I chose this theme for mothers. As I continue talking, you'll, I think, understand. This morning, I have three challenges for mothers. First of all, first one is to recognize your role. If there's one thing that Satan is trying to propagate via the media, Hollywood, and the like, is that in general, mothers, and particularly the Christian mother, is usually represented as being not very intelligent, ignorant even, close-minded, out of touch, flighty, definitely not worthy of respect, and usually wrong in her advice to her kids. But why do you think Satan would try to devote so much time to this lie? After all, the one thing we do know about Satan is he doesn't waste time. Time is a luxury he knows he doesn't have, and so everything he does is for a reason. In Proverbs 1.8 and 6.20, we are told by Solomon a statement that he repeats twice. Do not neglect your mother's instruction. This tells me, number one, that a mother's role is to instruct. It's her directive. It's part of her job description. It's not optional depending on her level of busyness, her personal agenda, what's popular, or what the majority of other mothers do or say. It's our charge as a Christian mother to guide and to teach. And number two, there must be something of great value that children are supposed to learn from God-fearing mothers. The fact that this is repeated stresses its importance. There is a huge chasm of difference between the role of the average mother and the godly mother. I'll give you an example. Most people would agree that food, shelter, clothing, and education are basic needs of children. And if you're meeting those needs, you're probably doing a good job. But to the Christian mother, she knows that although food is important, she has to teach her child that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Shelter is important. But she'll want her child to someday say, for you, Lord, have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Clothing, of course, that's important. But she'll want her child to proclaim, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as good as education is, she knows that God has told her, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In the book Education, we read that in the children committed to her care, every mother has a sacred charge from the Heavenly Father. And it is her privilege, through the grace of Christ, to mold their characters after the divine pattern, to shed an influence over their lives that will draw them toward God and heaven. What a mandate. See, the role of a Christian mom is to build godly characters. As you can imagine, this is no easy feat. So first and foremost, the godly mother must be a learning mother. We must be getting our directive, our agenda, our daily instructions from the Lord. In the Adventist home, we are told that mothers may understand that as they follow God's directions in the training of their children, they will receive help from on high. Therefore, as we learn, we make the necessary changes to our character, and those are the tools that help us to teach our children correctly. A godly mother must also be a praying mother. Prayer is the fuel that gives the godly mother the energy and the power to do her duties. And Spirit of Prophecy tells us that did mothers but realize the importance of their mission, they would be much in secret prayer, presenting their children to Jesus, imploring his blessing upon them, and pleading for wisdom to discharge or right their sacred duties. Remember that we only plead to someone when we need something desperately and we recognize it, and when we also recognize that we don't have it. So we need to be um, genuine in our recognition of that. And what does it mean by secret prayer? Well, secret prayer is the prayer that you have alone in your room with the Lord. And why do we need to do this? Well, because up until the time that a child becomes self-reflective, it's a Christian mother's duty to study her children's character so much that their weaknesses and strengths are clear to her. 
She should know her children in a sense better than they know themselves. And why is this important? Well, for one, that way she can pray more personal, specific, customized prayers for her child. I could probably pray a prayer for every child here without knowing a single thing about them. I could pray for their health, their education, that they are a good boy or a good girl, and it doesn't mean anything specific and personal. But us mothers, we spend more time with our children than anyone else. So we owe it to our children to pray for them more than this generic bless them and keep them prayer. They deserve better prayers. It also preserves the dignity of our child as we pray in secret prayer, and it helps us to give us the tools that we, that we need in order to help our children. Finally, a godly mother is called to be a fearless mother, and I just want to encourage mothers here to raise your child in a godly way, irrespective of what society says. This passage for Mother from Spirit of Prophecy says, her first duty is to her children, to so mold their characters that they may be happy in this life and secure the future immortal life. She should not be influenced by what Mrs. So-and-so does or by the remarks of Mrs. A or B in reference to her being so odd, so different from other people in her dress or in the arrangement of her house for comfort rather than display or in the management of her children. You see, every child requires a unique training. If little Johnny over here has a propensity for a willful, disobedient uh, temperament, his training by his mother will look vastly different than the training of a mother whose child is more cooperative. This child may also have issues that need to be addressed, but the parenting styles of these two mothers will look different, and that's okay. We have to be okay with that, and we need to not judge other mothers according to their way of training. My second challenge to mothers is taste test your faith. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the, in this case, mother who trusts in him. In an interview that Tyler Perry once made, he made a statement about his worship experience as a child. He said that when he was with his mother at church, that was the only time I really saw my mother smile was when she was up there in the choir singing and happy. It's been very important to me, and it is stitched into my fabric. And those last words really resounded in me. You see, when little Tyler looked up at his mom worshiping, it imprinted in, onto him and made a lifelong impression on him. When our children look at us at church, what do they see? Do they see a smile? Do they see enthusiasm? I know some of us, we have a rough week I don't expect a fake smile. Children sometimes need to learn that we can have peace in our heart without being smiley. But do they at least see interest? Do they see energy? Or do they see yawning, timekeeping, sneering, snickering, and rebuttals made under our breath? What are we imprinting on our children? And this 